Hello and welcome to Talk Gnosis. This is our spin-off show, The Black Iron Prison, where we talk to people who may not cons necessarily consider themselves Gnostics or not quote-unquote part of the Gnostic world, whatever that is. If you ask me, we're in a Gnostic world. <laughs> but uh, we're talking to uh, artist Sterling Bartlett, um, and he released uh, an awesome uh, graphic novel, art book, comic. What do you call it, Sterling? That's a comic. It's a comic, yeah. I actually have kind of hate using the phrase graphic novel now because it's just like a pretentious way to like be like, I don't read comic books. Anyways, here it is. It's how did we get here? Uh, for all those people at home, I am holding it up on the screen. You can get your own copy. Um, oh, wait, I didn't do the banner yet. But hey, we'll, we'll do that plug in a moment. You know what? <laughs> I'll do... Uh, I'll, uh, <laughs> <laughs> paying myself first in, in plugs uh hey everybody we can't do the show without your support i hate begging for money but i gotta do it paypal.com slash gnostic for one-time donations uh you can go to patreon.com slash gnostic where you can donate for as little as a dollar per piece of media per month uh and you get early access to the shows we're going to put the credits back on you'll get your name in the credits we're always trying to give people stuff for signing up for the patreon without actually locking up any content we're doing Doing uh, more than this, so so for instance, I'm not running this show through the Patreon. We only run you know four to six shows through the Patreon. The rest are are kind of paid for by your generosity. So we actually are starting a bunch of different spinoff shows. This isn't the only one. You know, we're over on Twitch uh, doing live streams of Cult. We're on Twitch doing Talking Gnosticism, which is a, a panel hangout show. We're always trying to do more stuff. So uh, give us your money so we can do even more, and so I don't starve to death. Uh, Sterling, uh, I want to tell people at the top of the show we'll also remind them at the back uh and to pick up the book and where to do it so just give me one sec here to do the banner because this is important um you know people they zone out they turn it off okay get your copy of how did we get here at first slash products slash how did we get here uh, it's going to be in the show notes if you're listening to this as audio so uh stop whatever you're doing go buy it and then come back and hit uh play uh and listen to the rest of this interview uh, Sterling, uh, I did make some notes, um, uh, uh, not a proper question sheet. Some of my notes are one or two words, but how did we get here is a question the Gnostics were obsessed with. This is where they start all their mythology, right? And they thought it was very important to understand in a mythological sense or a religious sense, how did we get here? Because we, we can't get out without understanding how we got here. So tell us about your comic. How do we get here? Your inspiration for it. Why did you feel compelled to create it? Sounds good. Uh, first, thanks for having me. Um, stoked to discuss the book and uh, chat with you a little bit. Uh, how did we get here is essentially a 10-part hellfire sermon, uh, kind of uh, being proselytized by a uh, intergalactic entity named Void. Um, he uh, descends to Earth and uh, proceeds to hopefully um, uh, give us a, uh, a little bit of a pep talk so we can uh, graduate galactic kindergarten. Perfect. Perfect. And I think already some people, uh, even if you didn't set out to create a, a religious text, right? We already have some religious language here with, with the sermon uh, and with the, the visitor kind of coming to, to, to wake us up. Um, and uh, I did notice, right, we, we have a, a, at the beginning, the void isn't, isn't the first messenger for you, right? We have angels, Bigfoot, we have cryptids, we have aliens, with the void yes. saying, I'm not the only messenger. Yes. Do, do you believe, and again, we don't have to talk about this in religious language, right? You know, there's Hegelian and the collective unconscious and yeah. lots of sort of different ways of thinking about this. But an inbreaking of something new, an inbreaking of a new way of living, or an inbreaking of an old way of living it in breaking do you, do you believe in something like that sterling certainly yeah uh and, and actually that's kind of a, a new uh mode of thinking for me as i sort of enter middle age it's it i you know essentially grew up a uh center leftist uh person that was a uh, rather humanist and um i definitely had a, a kind of change of uh a, i don't want to say a change of heart like a change of mind um just reading enough stories that pointed back to some sort of a creation myth or like a, a breaking in uh, that definitely became a part of my consciousness uh, a few years back. And that definitely informed uh, writing this book. Yeah. 
I uh, we get some feedback almost never directly, almost every se uh, second hand. Which, by the way, I, I'm very approachable. If anybody ever wants to talk to me about anything on the show, I'll dialogue. Right. So my email is down below. But reading the book, I was thinking some people are going to read this and be like, this this flipping commie. And then I was reading it, and uh, I was thinking some people are going to read it and be like, you know, this incel Chad alt right yeah. monster. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how there's something to piss off everybody in this book? Yeah, I mean, I personally am staunchly nonpartisan uh, as, as a general rule. Uh, and I wanted to have that come across in the book itself. There are jabs at subtle jabs, maybe oblique uh, jabs at leftist politicians, at recycling. Um, but at the same time, there is an overarching kind of pervasive, shall we say, like queasiness or mistrust of power structures. And um, again, kind of obliquely, that make that ensures that we're not um, coming from a far right position or a far left position. And I, I I'm really itchy about the sort of centrist idea. It, it's not that either, because a centrist would imply that you're kind of half in one camp and half in the other. And this is an entity that is coming at us from outside of our political structures, outside of our cultural structures, and critiquing them in a, in a real top-down way. And, and that, was, that was the sort of impetus for me when I started writing this. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I kind of deliberately, uh, as I said, people, I think, guess what my politics are sometimes when, when I do talk about this is not meant to be a politics show. Right. Sure. But to talk about Gnosticism, I have to talk about the world that we live in. So some people read that as political uh, and they guess my politics, but they always yeah. guess wrong and you're never going to guess and I'm never going to tell. <laughs> so <laughs> um, but kind of staying with that theme for for, for a moment, Sterling, like. That, for the ancient Gnostics, for the modern Gnostics, uh, as I said, one one thing they were obsessed with was how do we get here? But of course, they were obsessed with just that the world sucks and we have to wake up to the fact that the world sucks. But it seems it seems to me that that a lot of people have woken up to the fact that the world sucks, that there's that there's major problems. But but the right says it's because of Hollywood and cult cultural Marxism, you know, no prayer in schools. You know, the center says it's because of fake news and extremism on both the right and the left. Right. The, the cultural left says it's because of the racist cishet patriarchy and people aren't recycling enough. Yeah. So so people know that things suck. And I always thought, and particularly you know, being a child of the 90s, you know, before we started recording, you know, I, I, I grew up at the end of history. I graduated high school in 1999. People did not think that the world sucked, right? I mean, the Goths at school did. But you know what I mean? There was. It was the end of history, but there was a, a weird sort of optimism, right? This is this is it, right? We, we have it all figured out. Exactly. So, so is the first step figuring out that this sucks? And... These narratives that I mentioned, both the right, the left, and the center, can any of these lead to, to freedom? Well, there's a huge question there. Let me first address, <laughs> let me first address the beginning, which is, do, do these conversations matter? And the answer is yes. I wouldn't have spent a year and a half writing a book uh, and, and hoping to get it published if I didn't think these conversations matter. More importantly, I think it's important to have a novel take and an interesting inroad into these conversations that is not particularly left, right, or center. Yeah. Uh, so addressing that, I, I'm not sure if I can really frame the second part of your question. Uh, however, I, I think we're at, you know, the end of the end of history or the beginning of something new. That's the that's a bit optimistic. I'm not sure. But this is the point where we get narratives together. This is the this is the point in this beginning arc or the end of the end of arc or whatever it is, where we really have to kind of like figure it out, get our ducks in a row, and then push forward. Yeah. And uh, I do really appreciate how both the book and just talking to you, how 
stepping outside of at least these political frames, right? Which is which is which is also kind of a cliche, right? But I, as often coming from centrists, that you know this thing I want to talk about, I don't want to talk about it in a political way. But at the same time, you know this is what I, what I'm trying to do with the show. This is what um, the religious communities I'm associated with are trying to do, right? Like we we don't. You know, you're. We want you to watch the show, regardless of your beliefs. We want you, when when I do religious stuff, to to come, as long as you're respectful of other people's beliefs. Um, but I, I wonder, uh, and, and you know, I'm I'm just spinning. I'm ju I'm just spinning here. But how do we sort of kind of reach people um, and talk about these issues without the political lens and people immediately going to, to to culture war political stuff, right? Because this is how we communicate. It's how we talk about important issues. Well, first, there is no non-political. The personal is the political. The cultural is political. So it's just, it, it, again, it's just about reframing. So yes, we are talking about politics. I am talking about politics and almost every single one of these 10 entries uh, in this book, uh, 10 small chapters. However, the way we talk about it is through community. We talk about it, you know, finding that wherever that means outside that sphere, you know, drawing out a, a Y or a, a Z axis in this X, Y thing we've been uh, sort of trapped in for so long, you know, you call the show the Black Iron Prison. That's a great example right there. Uh, but a, a reframing, through the lens of community, as well as humor. Like, mm. Spoonful of Sugar is very real to me. Like, I always go back to that. Uh, the, the bits of culture that really downloaded themselves in my mind when I was young uh, that had an element of politics or an element of cultural critique in them were always humorous. Like, immediately I think of um, Terry Gilliam, for example. Yeah, and uh, the, for those to to again to encourage people to get the book, if when I talk about it, it sounds like you know you're on meth on a box screaming at people, right? But it, it's not that. It's playful. <laughs> it's fun. The funny, the 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 humor comes through, right? So I, I think I think you have achieved that, and it's it's great that that is, that is obviously obviously your goal. So just just to get that across to to people, um, Sterling, do you believe in transcendence? And if you do, have you ever experienced it? That's tough. Um, capital C concept. Yes, I believe in transcendence. Uh, I am personally a very quotidian uh, kind of day-to-day -day individual. If I've experienced transcendence, it's been through uh, things like psychedelics or uh, being in nature, uh, lowercase t transcendence. Um, I don't know that I've experienced it writ large. Uh, do I believe in it? Certainly. Yeah. You know, I, I actually wonder about when you say writ large, like, you know, sometimes there's this idea of, of transcending and kind of staying there. And, and I suspect that the, the elements of transcendence or the experience of transcendence that you described is whatever this transcendent stuff is, right? And there's different ways of experiencing it and getting there because it's natural and human. There's a lot of roads there. I, I had a conversation yeah. not too long ago about like heavy, like doses of like drug experiences and stuff. And, uh, I was joking with the person, but I was serious and saying like, oh, I experienced ego death. And they're like, no, you didn't. You're here talking with me now and, you know, whatever. And I was like, well, that shit grows back. <laughs> yes. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and I would like to, for a sec, riff on that too, which is uh, for those uh, the, who are watching who are spiritual practitioners, right? That uh, Sterling has, has just delivered a very profound teaching there, or, or, or Sterling and your friend did, because this has been my experience both personally and sort of dealing with others who are doing a lot of work on themselves and doing stuff like meditation, and they feel like they've made some progress. But uh, as you put it, that shit grows back. Yeah. <laughs> um, we talk a lot about art of salvation on this show, 
and you you and and transcendence through art and understanding Gnosticism as a kind of art, art as a kind of Gnosticism. These are recurring themes. It's something we talk a lot about on the Black Iron Prison, but as well as as the, the mainstream show. And actually, if, if you look throughout history, you know, a, a lot of uh, great artists were inspired specifically by Gnostic ideas. But so so there's the transcendence through art. There's the Gnosticism of art. But what I want to ask you about is the art world, which I suspect, which I'm not a part of, which I suspect is very different from art and perhaps may not have these transcendent elements and salvational functions. So can you speak to that a little bit? Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, at the top, I'll just say I was um, a very peripheral spectator to the art world for about 20 years. Never been a major player, but I've seen behind the curtain enough to know how uh, at least a little sliver of it works. Um, essentially, the art world is a, uh, you know, and we, I discussed this in the book, but it's, a, it's an economy fueled by a sole commodity, commodity being art, of course. Um, if you think of it more like a stock or a commodity that's openly traded on a marketplace, you have a much better idea of what the art world is than if you went into it um, with ideas of transcendence or ideas of uh, uh, school, art school as pipeline to a, uh, a certain kind of high-minded idealism. Yeah. Um, and of course, I, I am sort of asking specific questions about some of the, the chapters in the book, right? Uh, so, but everybody, as I said, it's dealt with in, in very interesting ways. So uh, don't, don't think you're getting a download of, of what's in the actual book. But you have, you have a chapter on, on boredom and the abolition of boredom. Sure. And you know, I found that really fascinating because one, I'm someone who's always hated, quote unquote, being bored. Um, you know, I grew up in a small town in, in the 80s and 90s. Uh, so I was acquainted with boredom in, in a way that, that people my age now, or sorry, you know, teenagers now would have no conception of. Right. <laughs> you know? right. Right. So can you talk a little bit about like and I am addicted to my phone. I like not being bored. But can you right. talk a little bit about you know why this may not be the best thing in the world? Yeah, I mean I, I've spoken about this a, a few times in in uh, discussing the book. The there is a chapter called the abolition of boredom, and it's essentially two people in an office space. Uh, one being a man, the other being a woman who's kind of vaguely interested in him, and he has no clue because he's in his phone and you know he doesn't know that she's flirting with him successively over the course of a, a, of a work day. Um, I want to mention something that I've noticed. You mentioned that you, uh, growing up in the 80s and 90s, had a certain conception of boredom and you now um, run a podcast in which you try to discuss uh, high-minded topics with a disparate number of people. That's a generative approach to boredom. Uh, when you say like uh, a younger person now that, uh, you know, digital natives born and raised on the internet may not experience, I think there's been a shift between a generative type of boredom, harnessing your boredom and writing it into uh, a, a project. Uh, for me, that was drawing endlessly. You know, I would just begin to doodle and that, you know, became a career for me. But, and for you, it's the podcast and a, a, no, a number of other endeavors, I'm sure. I wonder if harnessing and wrenching boredom into generative prospects is as widely received as I think it was in the time that we grew up. And I don't want to get trapped in like a nostalgia no. reality too. That's not, that's not generative or helpful either. But uh, it's, it's a question that always comes back to me. Yeah. Well, you know, just to um, to to make sure that that it's not two boring old farts talking about the old days, right? This is <laughs> the, it does seem like the world's going downhill. But let's hop in the time machine and go back literally twenty years ago sure. to the release of the premiere album by the Strokes, because I remember, <laughs> you know, living in you know the dumpy house of five other people while going to college, right? And so I'm bringing it over and being like, "You got to listen to this. This is the best thing I've ever heard," right? Yeah. So can you talk a little bit about about the strokes and 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 viewing, I, I think some people might find this this humorous, but kind of uh, um, 
the, the Gnostics are obsessed with, with sort of the falseness of reality, of deception, mm -hmm. of being trapped in illusion. So can you talk about the strokes and with some of these themes? I mean, absolutely. You brought up in just casually Fukuyama's The End of History, right? Yeah. And to me, the strokes are the emblem. They are the band. They are <laughs> they're Sergeant Peppers of the end of history. Yeah. Uh, they were... They were packaged and uh, sort of advertised as a new savior for rock and roll, when in fact they were a garage rock band uh, in the tradition of a million other garage rock bands that were an amalgam of Tom Petty and the Ramones and the Replacements and in equal parts and all of their reference from their logo, which was the Magna cigarette brand, to all their clothes look like Lou Reed. Um, when in reality, while, while they were packaged as this new thing, there couldn't be anything less new. It was like the full force of the history of rock and roll had been distilled and put into little bottles and we were all just chugging it. And it, at the time, I was absolutely enamored of like the what they ended up calling like the garage rock revolution or revival or whatever it was. Um, in retrospect, it was just simply nothing new. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, no, I, I I remember liking a lot of bands from that movement, and of course, this sounds like you know I'm trying for twenty year old cool points, right? But I remember when they did bring that album over, I was like, this shit sucks. Like, I have television on vinyl; we can put that on right now. Sure, right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, although there is a lot of, I was very, very influenced and, and did really, did really like the, the garage rock revival at the time. Uh, have you read the most embarrassing book ever written was, is Meet Me in the Bathroom. Have you ever read that? No, I know of it. I haven't read it. <laughs> if you're looking for a hate read, my friend, uh, I mean, I hate read slash like it's, uh, I, I, uh, I hate to be a 40 year old man using this word that, that is already what it portrays, but it's, it cringe all capital letters, yeah. right? Like you, you'll, you may weep from embarrassment for the writer. Uh, <laughs> so if you, if you want to do that to yourself, read, read that book, <laughs> um, urban daredevils. Uh, again, uh, when we're kind of, uh, the, to go back to being old farts, maybe there's maybe there's some Zoomers watching this who are like, what are what are they talking about? But can you just, I don't really have a deeper question than that. <laughs> That's the question, Urban yeah. Daredevil's question mark. Yeah, so again, there are like 10 small chapters uh, where this entity comes and, and, and sort of gives us these little cues as to, you know, some cultural or political or societal reasons of, uh, why we are in our, our our current kind of dystopian present. One is uh, is just a one page single image, and it says "Urban Daredevils." Now, "Urban Daredevils" is a oblique reference to a uh, a portion in the in the Kentucky Fried movie, uh, which is very different from what I'm describing. But that is where the title comes from. Uh, in this book, it, the picture are two young people shot from above holding a uh, an iPhone extension handle, whatever they're called, selfie stick, from the very top of the tallest building in the tallest city. And uh, Void is pictured kind of, you know, with his hand out describing the, the image and says something to the effect of, do you remember living in a, uh, a time in which everything was so hermetically safe that you actually had to engineer your own demise. You had to engineer the threat to your own mortality. And this stems from me seeing, I don't know, tens, hundreds of TikTok and Instagram videos of these like weird kids that would just climb to the top of buildings. And some were base jumpers and others would just get their kicks by like doing push-ups on the top of a crazy building. It's nauseating to look at. It makes you terrified. But um it was pervasive enough that I thought that it had to have some larger societal implication. And with uh, the onset of the pandemic or whatever, that was one of the last ones I drew. And I, I was, it was just a, a real notion that something had really changed in our perception of safety and uh, our perception of like compliance to certain rules. Yeah, yeah. Um so I was talking a bit about you. You know, you have that 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 great uh, 
intro bit with the with, with the messengers of the inbreaking, right? Angels, <laughs> cryptids, uh, and and the void is is our messenger now. But yeah. unlike per, and this is also a very Gnostic idea. The Gnostics were some of the first to look at at different world religions and say, you know, actually that that prophet or that leader from your religion uh, was is 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 a Gnostic uh, prophet, right? Like there's right, right. continuously coming from the source uh, messengers, right? Yes. Um, and and of course also not just in this in that specific case, you know, those were in many cases literal human beings, but they would also say, you know, that God or that angel that you talk to in your dream, uh -huh. right? So why why is the void the the inbreaking messenger yeah in your in your book as opposed to another messenger and and why does the book end with a threat right because the void says you know i've come i've given you the message but if you don't receive it then you know you're gonna i'm going to be back yes um well there without spoiling anything yep. there is a uh, a rather severe kind of call it an Easter egg or a Rosetta Stone, and in the interior final page of the book, that points to Void's not only Gnostic origins, but bureaucratic origins. Mm -hmm. uh, and there is a subtle nod to the fact that, in at least in the cosmology of this comic, there may be a structure to this universe that is both, uh, shall we say, um, like... Uh, religious but also like very flat and quotidian yeah uh that with again without spoiling i'm, I'm speaking kind of obliquely here but like Please. yeah without without um spoiling it, that interior final page actually gives you the, the answer to the first part of your question yeah second the threat is implied therein as well however not being a majorly religious person myself, there is always a little bit of a a taunt or a challenge that uh, that comes from these figures that are delivered to us from upon high. And I wanted to fold that into a lot of what we were what a lot of what I was talking about in the book. Uh, that that challenge um, kind of references the military industrial complex a little bit. Mm -hmm. And it challenges um, our notion of what it means to have conflict on Earth. Yeah, I, I really like that. And, and again, kind of uh, tying it into Gnostic themes, a lot of people read the Gnostic mythology, uh, you know, which says that that that, that this is this is a. Uh, a wor this world is a prison, right? And there's basically a, a celestial hierarchy that is doing its best to keep us there. And they read it as as pure evil, right? They they take these figures and see them as demonic. Where I I, I think at least an interesting reading, a valid reading, a reading that might have been on the minds of, of the people who originally created this mythology is they were dealing with the Roman Empire and with, at that point, the incredible bureaucracy of the Roman Empire. Yeah. And I would argue that what they're portraying is not necessarily evil entities, but a sort of cosmic bureaucracy, mm -hmm. right, that has, that yeah. has different values than we do. Yeah. I, I often have this idea that, like, you know, Turtles all the way down, sure, but also yeah. maybe bureaucracy all the way up. Yeah, yeah. I, I would say uh, you know it's a it's it's spooky month when we're recording this. I've been trying to think of like of of uh, uh, horror movies and uh, content with, with gnostic themes, and I don't think I can do a whole show on Beetlejuice, but their portrayal of the afterlife as this as, as this horrible bureaucracy, I Absolutely. think it's very yeah. <laughs> that or, is or, just uh, another, another movie that comes to mind with that theme is uh, Defending Your Life, with Albert Brooks. Oh, I haven't seen it. Oh, I like Brooks. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, yeah. It is, it is specifically about um, the litigious and bureaucratic world you enter after this one. And you must literally defend your life in court. Yeah. Wow. Incredible. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'll probably watch it tonight. Awesome. I recommend it. Rip Torn. It's great. Fantastic. And and sorry, I don't mean to go through all 10 chapters and say, explain no. it. But uh, <laughs> I... Yeah, but uh, so, so you have the chapter on influencers, and there, I think a lot of people even now would say, you know, aren't aren't a lot of these 
a good thing because you know you have these these girl boss influencers right who are telling women to get in powers uh you have these uh sigma male influencers who are who are telling men to to live up to your dreams so are, are aren't these influencers trying to get us to reach our highest potential isn't this a positive thing in our culture the impulse to influence i mean in the in the book i call them disruptors uh, <laughs> because that's the you know sort of branded ideology we all have at this point, you know, the, the TED Talk industrial complex, et cetera. But um, the impulse to influence is positive. It's just the why behind it that I'm critical of. Uh, you know, there are, in, in one example, I use like Suze Ormond and Suze Ormond, whatever her name is. Uh, and, uh, you know, I say something like uh, she, she, she told you to get rid of your coffee every morning and instead invest the money in a Roth IRA. Yeah. And like that betrays a distance between that person and the average working person who's just trying to get through a day. You're going to take that person's coffee away from them now. Like, I don't know if that's really productive. Uh, I talk about uh, the guy who made the Soylent drink and uh, we, I get into only in a world where uh, you know work has overtaken so much of our lives, are there any need for these tips or tricks? Like, oh, you have to drink your food because you work twenty hours a day and sleep three. Like, that's not a good thing. These are patches for a sick culture. They're not ways to get ahead, really. Yeah. Um, just like when you were talking about the final page, right, and that you don't want to give away, quote unquote, all the secrets, yeah. right? Like we, we want people to approach it as, as a piece of art. So you don't have to answer these questions, but again, if you could talk about them or talk about why you ended the book with them, but you end the book with three important questions. Yeah. Should we accelerate or hit the brakes? Yeah. Am I really helping or just play acting? And of course, how do we get here? Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, the first is uh, a nod to uh, accelerationist theory from Nick Land, a little bit of uh, Mark Fisher, the CCRU. Um, it's questioning, is that appropriate? And uh, is that a generative positive move? Or is that a way to uh, just make everything worse? And have we already been doing that? Uh, are we helping or are we just play acting? Now, this is where I, I do have some political allegiance because, uh, at least in the negative sense, uh, I, I see nothing but programmatic infographics lobbed at one another, uh, you know, just copy pasted, not even generated by the people that post these things. Uh, are, are you helping when you do that? When you are, are using someone else's words to chide and cajole your peers into thinking exactly the way you think? Is that helpful? Or is that punitive? So that's what I mean when uh, I ask, are we helping or are we just play acting? Uh, when we, you know, I'm, I'm critical of a number of things. Like I'm critical of the idea that like uh, of protest at this point even. Um, is that a way to let the higher ups know that you are uh, unhappy with uh, your day-to-day -day life? Or is it a just a way to post on Instagram that you were at X event or Y event. Uh, it sounds a little cynical. Um, this isn't to say I haven't protested things in the past. I've just become fatigued with a, uh, a kind of a pervasive narrative that does not seem to have gotten us anywhere. I, uh, you probably already know this, or probably all the listeners already know this, but I only, you know, it only, and it's obvious, but I, I'm not that smart. I wear class, glasses and use big words. So for 40 years, people have thought I'm smart. But uh, a, a protest is called a demonstration, right? And it was originally yeah. called a demonstration because it was a demonstration of the amount of people you could put out in the streets yes. as a fresh. Right? right, we will sh we will strike. We will we'll shut down you. the streets. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the the you know next time, but like we this we're showing you what we can do. We can grind society to a halt unless you make changes. We're going to do that, but that's that doesn't seem to be the point of so called demonstrations anymore, right? No, I don't think so. I I think in certain cases, 
it's the inverse of that. It's a uh, it's a lateral demonstration, not a demonstration from the bottom up. Yeah, yeah. Um, what's the reception to the book been? Largely positive. Uh, we are moving quite a few of them. We still have a few left of the publishers. Uh, if you know, in a perfect world, I'd love to sell this thing out before the end of the year, and it looks like we may be close to on track to doing that. You know, fingers crossed. We'll see. Uh, I've definitely gotten some pushback. Uh, even you mentioned in the very beginning, like this may seem like a, um, a a bit programmatic or a bit um, kind of like it's coming from like an all-knowing author. That's been a criticism. Um, but <laughs> those are also the people who uh, didn't pick up on the humor in the book. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> who knows. <laughs> Exactly. I I I, uh, uh, I I guess I could see that criticism, but it it's it's yeah, it, it's a dumb dumb criticism because I think when combined with the humor and the points of the book, uh, then you know a a more slightly more sophisticated reader should be able to pick that up. <laughs> I mean, at the end of the day, it's a comic book. Comic yeah. books went one of two ways growing up for me. They were either like high adventure and uh, or. And, and kind of like tinged with uh, soap opera elements, or they were very funny. Uh, and I, I, I tried to grab a little bit of both. Yeah. So I, I mentioned before I'm recording, this is this is a double Black Iron Prison day for me because I had the afternoon off. So I, I'm interviewing uh, Kristen Middleton from uh, Aeona Comics next. Uh, I'm going to throw that up on the screen. That's aeonacomics.bigcartel.com. You, you have a piece in there, there, the issue that just came out. Can you tell us yeah. a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. Aeonic Comics issue number two. I have a short story in it. Um, basically kind of dedicated to my dog. Uh, <laughs> uh, shout out to Clever. I, uh, it, it's called Wishbone Broken. And it's, uh, it's essentially a story of what would happen if uh, the beloved character Wishbone from uh, Saturday morning television uh, were to lose his marbles a little bit. And uh, maybe there are uh, some alien elements involved and maybe he has had uh, a certain part of his anatomy removed that a lot of uh, young male dogs experience. And it's from his point of view and how that would affect a, uh, a dog. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, are you working on anything presently and anything uh, coming out uh, that people should be looking forward to? I am working on a very long form uh, comic, I mean, graphic novel length, at least probably about 80, 100 pages. Yeah. Uh, I am just wrapping up the writing stage at this point, and I'm talking to a publisher about it. Very early days, all I can really say about it is uh, it's essentially about a pop culture figure that we all know and all dearly love and um, very, very prominent over the last 20 years that I am positing, uh, possibly in a vaguely nonfiction way, uh, has a lot of intelligence ties and what that means and how that played out over the last 20 years. Ah, very intriguing. Well, I'm going to buy it, read it, and if I could shoehorn Gnosticism into it somehow, <laughs> we're definitely... Yeah, we're definitely going to have you back on the show to talk about it. <laughs> uh, Sterling, I, I'm all out of questions, but uh, I, I I don't want to talk to you any more about the book because, again, I just want people to read it, right? So, um, yeah, can you tell people uh, where to get it again one more time? Yeah, absolutely. The book is available at uh, firsttonock.com. It's my publisher. Um, it is $7.50, and we also have a very, very limited number of hand-drawn covers available. So if someone wants a, you know, super snazzy deluxe edition, there are still a couple of those left. Fantastic. Uh, Sterling, thanks so much for coming on the show. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Awesome. Bye. See ya.